Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. I'm Eric Hoppe. I'm the head of marketing at Canny, and I will be hosting our panel today. Uh, we're going to be diving into how sales and product can work together uh, through feedback management. So, like I mentioned, we do have a great panel of product and sales leaders who are going to be discussing how you can work together uh, to grow your business. Uh, so, as the title suggests, one of the best ways to do that is through feedback management. Sales can gather really valuable insights and share them with your product team. That lets your product team build better products that solve prospects pain points. And ultimately that helps sales close more deals. But there is a lot more to it than that, which is what we're talking about today. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our panel. First up, we have Ross Dixon of On Call Health. Uh, could you give us a quick intro to yourself, Ross? Yeah, for sure. Nice to meet everyone. My name is Ross Dixon, Director of Sales at On Call Health. I've been with the company for uh, four and a half years and work with a lot of our, uh, our main customers that are still with us today. Uh, but yeah, pleasure to be here. We're happy to have you. Uh, next up is Jesse Saldana of Give Butter. Could you give us a quick intro, Jesse? Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Jesse Saldana. Um, like Eric said, I'm the director of product at GiveButter. I've been here just about a year, actually, as of next week. Um, work really closely with all departments, um, you know, just to understand customer feedback, customer pain points, uh, so that we continue continue to make the product better. Great. I and mean, we're excited to chat with you today. Um, and finally, we have Canny's own Alice Wong, our head of sales. Um, could you give us an intro, please, Alice? Hey everybody, my name is Alice. Um, I've been with Canyon for about 10 months now. I've been in tech sales for at least seven years and I came from a background where we didn't have any feedback tool to now diving in full fledged using a feedback tool to boost sales. So I'm very excited to share my knowledge with you all today. I'm excited too. So uh, we've given everyone a couple minutes to trickle in um, to our attendees. Uh, please feel free to submit questions as we go. We are going to have some time after we've had our scheduled discussion for audience questions, and we'd love to chat with you about your questions. So um, please just drop those in the Q&A section as we go. And with that, we are off to the races with our first question. Um, and it's a bit of a big one. Um, so first up, what role does feedback play in your sales process? And I think we'll ask Ross to start us off with this one. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Eric. So um, yeah, just kind of kicking it off, like at OnCall, we have a really long and strategic, very collaborative sales cycle. Uh, therefore, user feedback uh, is really, really critical at every stage. And uh, kind of breaking it out into two different components, I find that, you know, first, we collect our own user feedback on the sales team. We do a lot of listening, which helps like us have a more tailored and relevant sales process. And then we pass this along to other teams at on call. Uh, but on the flip side, other teams at the company collect their own user feedback, whether it be from marketing or, uh, or our product team, you know, on the marketing side, uh, they run user groups and talk to our customers and then they put together collateral and content for us. Uh, but then on the marketing side, uh, you know, they have the sole focus of putting together a better product, uh, which inevitably helps us uh, on the sales team and, and sell more. Cool. Yeah, feedback coming from all directions. Um, cool. Uh, Alice, do you have thoughts on this question? Yeah, so as a feedback company ourselves, of course, like we always listen to our customers as well as understanding what the key markets are and understanding exactly what the key gaps are in the product. So of course, like um, I try to be as diligent as I can for every single call and logging in every single request or even sometimes the things that our competitors have that we don't. So I definitely think like sales are the eyes and ears and we're the first person um, with talking to any prospect, understanding their pain point. So it's really important for us to really capture everything and be eyes and ears for marketing. Definitely, we we work pretty closely together and I must say that we do appreciate you being our eyes and ears. It is helpful. Um, cool, uh, I do wanna dive in a bit more on that though. Um, I think we talked a lot about how uh, feedback play is uh, influencing the sales process. Um, 
I'd like to dive in. How does feedback specifically help you with sales, uh, maybe closing deals, getting upgrades, like the actual selling function? Um, and for this question, uh, I think we'll also start with Ross. Yeah, for sure. So, I, I mean, you know, just to start off, of course, it helps with sales. Uh, you know, sales would be really easy if we could just kind of sit back and take orders, but that's not really how it works. Uh, you know, we need to be prescriptive and challenge the status quo. And that's kind of like the first bucket, I, I guess I'd, I'd put this into is challenging the status quo. You know, in order for us to, uh, to, do, to do this, you know, we, we need to um, uh, challenge our customers and our prospective customers to be successful and understand like where their major gaps are in the sales process and then, and then kind of uh, push them off the status quo. Uh, I'd also kind of say that in the, in the second bucket, adjusting the pitch, like we're not going to say the same thing every time on on every one of our calls so uh you know not everything is important to everyone and if we bring up everything on every call then you know bring up the kitchen sink then that can be a major distraction and, and really kind of hurt the sales process uh, yeah, but, I, think, I think that's a really you know. really interesting point it um kind of proper feedback management kind of helps you understand the pain points of your different personas and segments that you're going after. That's one thing at Canny that we really <clears throat> recommend people do is, is building segments of their audience and seeing what feedback are they leaving? What are the pain points they have? And I think that's a really powerful tool for sales to take and uh, you know adjust your, your messaging to that persona. So that's really interesting to hear you talk about that. Yeah, totally. And, and like, it's not just the sales team, it's uh, a collaborative effort across the company, right? And and it can be very hard to kind of share that information or disseminate it between different teams. But, you know, just as an example, our marketing team has done a really good job of putting together like different sales battle cards for us uh, with the different personas. For example, like if we're talking to an IT professional, then like X, Y, and Z is typically important for them. And we'll try and bring that up in the conversation a little bit more. Yeah, that's that's a really good idea. Alice and I might have to connect on that after after the call here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, Jesse, do you have any thoughts on how uh, how feedback can help your company sales process? Yeah, absolutely. So sales at GiveButter is a little different than at a lot of organizations. So GiveButter is a completely free product, right? So customers aren't signing contracts. Um, and that kind of means a few things, right? One, for most of GiveButter's existence, um, uh, customers have been coming to us organically, right? Self-serve. Um, and so for us, it's really been making sure that the product meets customer feedback, right? If we're not meeting what customers are looking for, they're going to look at other platforms. Um, more recently this year, we have introduced a sales team. And so we've been working really closely with them to kind of understand, you know, what are feedback points that they're getting? Um, how do those kind of match up to feedback that we get from customer success, customer support, who's another huge tool uh, for us in terms of aggregating feedback and just making sure that we're tracking and addressing feedback. Um, Tani is a huge part of our organization and how we kind of um, measure what customer needs are and what the kind of potential value is uh, for addressing that feedback. Yeah, I think you, you definitely touch on a really important topic there too, is um, it, it's nice to talk kind of from an abstract of like, oh, this is the feedback that I'm hearing. But the really cool thing is when sales can put a number behind that feedback, right? And to say, hey, this potential deal is worth 100,000 in ARR to us that means this feedback is very important. <laughs> um, so that's, I think, one thing that, that definitely it can be, uh, you know, especially through our CRM integrations, you know, pulling that data in kind of, I think it's, it's communicating with product without even having to have a conversation. If it just shows up and that deal value is there, that speaks louder than words, I think. Yeah. And, and and Eric, if I may, there, there's many wrinkles that you can kind of throw in here. So on call actually used to sell 
uh, into kind of like the solo practitioner, the SMB market, and we've moved upstream to enterprise. So over the years, we've seen like logging these product requests. It's really important to attribute like a deal value to it. And then kind of like, you know, not just the number of feature requests, but like also how, uh, how much revenue we could tie to that. And it's been interesting to kind of watch that over time. Yeah, I think I think that's super interesting is, um, you know, we've often said that, you know, not all feedback is necessarily as uh, valuable or or, or uh, prescriptive, really, you know, like you kind of run into the, you know, the noisy crowd situation where you might have a thousand people that have no revenue potential saying they want something and you know, that has the impact of leading product to build those features, whereas what's actually going to drive revenue and what is going to uh, deliver value is, is the, you know, the, the actual paying customers. So it's good to have them segmented yeah. out. I mean, there is, there is one more thing too. like, just say you have uh, kind of the outlier customer that has maybe like a, a ton of revenue potential, but it would kind of take your product roadmap off track. So like, I, I would say the other thing to throw in there is, you know, what we call is ICP, ide ideal customer profile. So the feedback loop between sales and product really helps to define that. Uh, you know, for example, uh, not, um, uh, you know, not, not every deal that we're working is gonna be 100% aligned with what, where the product is. But the closer that we get to building a better product for our, our ideal customer profile, the easier it is to sell into that group. And then like in turn, the more customer feedback we receive, the more defined our ideal customer profile is, if that makes sense. Com completely. We actually uh, are going to be publishing a guide um, to leveraging uh, feedback for sales and through interviewing people uh, salespeople from other companies that we are featuring in this guide. Uh, we often heard the story that product goes out and builds a new feature and then just tells the sales team about it. And it's like, go and sell this. <laughs> and they're like, well, this is not what our customers want. So this isn't going to help me close my sales. And, um, yeah, I think just being aligned gets everyone more success. Right. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty, well, we explored that question pretty well, um, but we're going to explore more about how, how feedback can support the sales cycle. Um, so I'm curious to hear, are there thoughts on how feedback factors in at different stages of the sales cycle, you know, perhaps from prospecting uh, down to negotiation to maybe up, upselling, you know, post the initial sale? Um, so I'm interested to dive into that. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that with Alice first. Oh, so when it comes to different stages, let's start with like prospecting and lead generation. So I definitely think, um, feedback can help us identify potential target customers, um, their needs and pain points. Um, and this will help the market kind of understand what message is really resonating with the marketing team the most um, and with the personas that can benefit from tools so which means to better lead generation efforts so it kind of goes in a full circle uh, when it comes to qualification in these assessment i think it's just actively listening to the feedback on what tools and processes they're using it helps me understand the deeper level what their pain point is what approach i should be taking and exactly what kind of features i should be demoing on the product um, at the demo stage, of course, like feedback doesn't stop. They always keep asking, I have to keep asking for um, uh, what their thoughts are, um, whether it's applicable. So I definitely think it's important to continuously get feedback on that stage, even during a demo. So that way you're not playing like one way ping pong by yourself. And at the follow up stage, if I do have any um, gaps in the product, I definitely think using feedback and any like feature requests and give them updates on the status would give me a good value add when it comes to the follow-up and upselling. So story time. So recently, um, Candy just launched an um, integration with Asana. So there's about 110 votes. Um, and I could, all I could do is just pull up the list of voters, see um, who's on the free plan, 
see who already has one integration because on the paid plan, you need two, pay those customers and see if they're ready to upgrade. So I definitely think having feedback ongoing throughout the entire sales cycle is very valuable. Yeah, de definitely. Um, I think it's interesting too, um, you know, you, we all end up getting those deals that are closed lost. Um, and occasionally that's due to a missing feature or something, right? So, um, that is pretty low hanging fruit. If you can be alerted that someone that is in closed lost, uh, might be interested in hearing about a feature that you built that they were interested in, right? Yeah. And I came from also another company that didn't have like a feedback tool at all. And I remember so many times where I would have to close loss a customer. And of course, I'm in sales. I'm not the best at taking notes. I just close loss at missing features without adding my notes. And then three weeks later, our product team's like, oh, guess what we built? And I have to be like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot who it was and who I have to follow up with. So there's definitely a lot of opportunities I missed out there just from not having a feedback tool. Definitely. I think uh, it's... I, th I think where marketing can help sales a lot of the times and correct me if I'm wrong, salespeople on the call is where we can automate and give you helpful nudges. Um, I think that can be a pretty valuable uh, contribution from the marketing team. And if you can build on the feedback management tool, that certainly makes it a lot more relevant. Cool. Um, Ross, do you have any thoughts on how feedback plays in at different stages of the cycle? Yeah, I mean, just kind of thinking about this, it's uh, it's it's pretty actually drastically different at every stage. And and you know, jumping off of talking about marketing, that's when like the early stage we work together with them a lot. So business development and prospecting, uh, you know, we we we're sending out email cadences and we don't have or cadences and we don't have the opportunity to have a conversation yet because we're just trying to jumpstart those conversations. So that those are largely based on personas and we need to be very accurate with those or else we're not going to be successful but then also throwing in things from marketing like customer stories or case studies to help generate interest and and have them relate to what we're selling uh, moving along a little bit uh, once we have an opportunity doing a lot of discovery uh you know exactly like alice was saying it, it's a, it's a conversation right like what's working well what isn't uh our our teams like uh, the common trends and 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 things that we're circling back to marketing and product at that point and then uh and then like once we're actually demoing the product it's much more of a conversation right uh, but this is where we have to challenge them and kind of like I was saying before, move them off of status quo. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, further on nearing the end of the sales cycle, this is where it kind of like really pivots. So, uh, you know, we need to have uh, like customer references of with similar accounts. So like how do we identify what those similar accounts are like through customer feedback? validating uh, certain areas of the platform, uh, keeping customer references relevant, you know, like specific feature sets. And then uh, just the last thing here is post sales cycle. Uh, you know, when they're a current customer, we do things like uh, post implementation customer surveys, find out what we're doing right. And that includes questions about like, you know, what did you like about the sales process? And, uh, and then, you know, we have like M NPS and likelihood to recommend and stuff like that. So but, like, very different things throughout the whole sales cycle. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's just really interesting. I think we keep coming back to this point that it really connects multiple departments and the general underlying theme is it's better when everybody works together and shares information, right? Um, and I think as, as a marketer, what you were talking about there is really interesting as well because you know, we've seen it where the sales team will be out talking to prospects or leads and say, oh, we want this, we want to accomplish this. And it's like, we already do that, but there's something off with our positioning or with our, our help docs. And like, you know, that's an opportunity for us to be like, oh, we actually should update this. We should make it known that this pain point that our ICP is concerned about, we already do. And we just need to adjust positioning. So I think really everybody can kind of learn from feedback and 
you know, certainly marketing's role in the sales cycle can be improved as well by acting on that feedback. And it's, it's not all on product, right? Just, yeah, most, I, just mostly on product. <laughs> it, it's very challenging though, across the whole organization and inevitably, like, I, I think we do a pretty good job at on call, but inevitably some information is going to get missed as it bounces between teams. And it's like, that it sucks because we're getting all this great information in the sales process and, and products learning so much about our customers. You know, they really know them intimately once they do like the, the customer interviews, you know, but, and then we're sharing like maybe 80% of that info, but you know, it, it's hard because we want all of it. Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's really interesting too. Like uh, sales can actually be a really interesting avenue for discovering new ICPs and new use cases too. Like we've gotten all kinds of comments from Alice and this might be a function of Canny being a fairly flexible tool. Um, it could be used for like idea management for different use cases, but um, you know, different types of ICPs that it might be interesting for us to market to um, and help, help sell to potentially lead feature development. So it's, um, you know, that, that feedback coming in and being visible to everyone just has so many spin-off benefits. That's true. I mean, at the end of the day, we're going to go where the revenue is. So if your sales team and, and your individual sales reps are like, Hey, I could really close this deal. And then, you know, maybe that does open up a different avenue for the company. Absolutely. And I think, uh, be, being close to the revenue is really good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, that's actually a pretty good transition to our next question because I want to talk about numbers. Uh, so this question is, what metrics and KPIs do you track to measure the impact of user feedback on sales performance? And I was thinking we might start with Jesse on this one. Yeah, so, you know, I think I'll talk a, a little bit about this more on the retention side. Like I said, you know, the sales org here at GetBetter are still relatively new, so we're kind of hashing out those KPIs as it relates to customer feedback, the way we think about it a lot on customer retention um, and really preventing customer churn is making sure that, you know, we're not losing customers because we're missing one or two really key features, right? We want to make sure that uh, we have enough product maturity that over the long haul, we can really be the product for customers. And so, we do that, um, you know, not only through anecdotal uh, kind of feedback from customer success, but really leveraging um, customer feedback through Canny to say, hey, it's clear that folks uh, need this one feature, otherwise they're gonna, we risk losing out on a subset of customers. And that really shapes uh, the product roadmap. You know, one of products KPIs, for example, is, uh, completing a certain number of canny feedback requests every quarter. And so that really helps us ensure that we're pretty organically building a product that really meets customer needs. Um, and I think, you know, nothing makes someone happier than them learning that like, hey, this thing I asked for or kind of requested like actually happened, right? That uh, goes such a long way in terms of like customer satisfaction and happiness. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even people that didn't quite make it to being customers, like yeah. if it was a lead that didn't quite close, you know, that's uh, a huge trust builder that not only did sales listen to you, but product also then listened and built the thing they wanted. Like that's just so huge. Yeah, exactly. And and kind of to the point earlier about like winning back close loss deals that happens a lot for us because fundraising cycles are very cyclical, right? So a lot of campaigns might be run in the fall or the spring. And so maybe we didn't have a key feature they needed last year, but this year we can say, hey, you know what? We built this, we listened to feedback. And a lot of times that's how we'll kind of start winning deals um, year over year. Yeah, and, and not making the salesperson go and dig through other <laughs> CRM notes is always nice <laughs> Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, sorry. I, I'm, I'm making Alice laugh, and she's the next person to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm laughing because um, I felt the pain. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, um, Alice, uh, what, what KPIs and metrics uh, do you think are, are important to track to, uh, to measure how feedback is helping uh, sales performance? Yeah, so I came from a sales world and sales performance is pretty straightforward. It's all about revenue, revenue, revenue. So I love the fact that you can actually see the um, opportunity impact directly in Canny linked to per feature. I definitely think that's really helpful. Um, and also asking for feedback um, when a deal is closed loss help us build a better product, which should help us be more competitive. So I think seeing a drop in like closed loss due to competitors is also a really good sign. Right. So you could almost like even look at your pipeline and see like if there was associated feedback uh, with cl closed deals and if there was resolved feedback and you had a a higher close win rate or a, or a lower close loss rate, you're, you can kind of start to attribute some, 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 some benefit and conversion Im impact from closing feedback. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Cool. Alrighty. Um, and our next question is a bit open ended. Uh, so uh, if it, anyone who wants to chime in here can, but we'll start with Ross. Um, just looking to see, do you have any examples uh, from your past uh, on how user feedback, customer feedback has helped you boost sales? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was going to start off with talking about uh, closed loss pipeline because, uh, because that's obviously a big example of how we use uh, customer feedback to help boost sales. Uh, so just kind of quickly we have a number of opportunities that are closed lost because of a specific feature gap and our team measures that in impact like we've been talking about with total closed lost accounts or dollar volume attributed to those accounts and that like definitely helps shape the product roadmap uh, but the key here is uh you know we at least we try but we personally follow up with those accounts and once we build and release those features, they've been interested in. So there's like a direct um, correlation between like the feedback and then us actually like getting back that revenue. It's, it's, that's a really interesting example, I think. And it's it's cool too, if you, if you kind of know like what is our typical conversion rate on re-engaging these deals after we've addressed their the main feedback requests they have, you can almost start to estimate like what dollar amount do we expect from this deal, right? Like realistically, you know, the total potential is just all the deal value, but what are we going to close? Like uh, very quickly, you can see what the revenue impact is going to be, right? It's really good metric to follow, I think. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I, I have like kind of a, a different example, actually, that's a little bit more like uh, real world. So uh, recently we had actually, we received a lot of customer feedback that a specific feature of e-signature as a part of our telehealth solution was really important. And this was coming like uh, uh, pretty rapidly and it was for whatever reason, very important, you know, within the last several months. And, and this feedback was kind of coming in all shapes and sizes, you know, like it, it's not like everyone's like, okay, this is exactly what we need and how we need it. It, it might be like, uh, they're looking at our website and uh, we're finding it hard to get them on a call or, or maybe it's during a demo. They're like, Hey, do you have this feature? And then they don't say much else about it or, or, uh, or, you know, further along, they're saying they don't want to move forward. Uh, and we ask why, and then maybe that comes up. Uh, so anyways, it, it turns out because we do, we try to do a good job of like logging these and noticing trends uh, with our various opportunities. It turns out that there was a change in regulation in the state of Pennsylvania, actually, with regards to e-signature on a specific type of form. And everyone was just kind of scrambling to get the right solution. And it, 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 um, we found out that everyone was kind of coming to us for that solution. So it is actually like a good story in the end because we circled that feedback back to product and we actually obviously, you know, we had the roadmap locked in, but they were able to pivot pretty quickly. We got a great solution out to them and then we were able to capture a lot of that business. And, uh, and give marketing a little nudge to set up some campaigns targeting Pennsylvania. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. 
that's a great example. Uh, Alice, do you have any examples that you'd like to share? Oh, um, Ross totally stole my idea on following up on those <laughs> lost leads over there, I guess. Yeah. Great minds think alike. Um, but yeah, recently, um, just circling back to the example of like, uh, Kenny just recently launched a sauna and for me to be able to have like a leads list right there and it's hot because they asked for it, it definitely helped me um, come up with different um, innovative and creative ways to follow up with the customer instead of just like, hey, remember us? It's me again. So that definitely helped. And you've uh, <clears throat> you've got that cool video of Dan in the sauna that you can share with them as an icebreaker too, right? So. <laughs> We had a check check if you're if you're watching check out the video we had a little little fun wordplay on uh, on the asana name that involved an actual asana anyway <laughs> uh jesse uh, did you have any examples you wanted to share yeah definitely um you know one kind of big feature that we launched in the last year and something that we've continued to put a lot of attention to is auctions um so auctions was a feature request that we had for a long time. I think for a while it didn't have a ton of traction. Um, but then, you know, I think by the time we started really scoping it, it, it out, it had around 600 uh, votes on Canny, which is a lot of feedback uh, around it. And so, you know, we clearly saw this as an opportunity. Um, it's a new way for organizations to fundraise, uh, collect donations um, and spent last summer into the fall building out the platform. And it's, you know, we launched it in late September. Um, and since then it's just become a really huge success for us. Uh, it's definitely been a really big area of growth. Um, we see quite a few auctions created week over week um, and have really been able to see kind of uh, also transaction volume grow through that platform as well. Cool. Yeah, that, that sounds like a great example. Um, cool. Well, that actually wraps up our scheduled questions and we are pretty much on time. So that means I'm doing an okay job. Uh, but now we're going to pivot to audience questions. Uh, and for our panelists, uh, feel free just to jump in on any of these that you want to. Um, the first question is from an anonymous attendee and they ask, how do you express how valuable feedback is? How do you communicate it to your team? Uh, yeah, so like I, I can I can field that one. So how do we express how valuable feedback is? Uh, so we actually use a, a number of different tools to help communicate this to the team. Uh, you know, we use uh, Canny to help log feature requests and prioritize them. The main thing here is how valuable it is. Uh, we attribute uh, a revenue uh, amount to those requests. But we also like to provide a little bit of extra context to other teams. So we use other tools like Gong. We've set up triggers. So like if our sales reps say the term product team, then our product managers can go in and listen to the call. Um, but uh, but then we also have like a, a weekly product office hours. So our teams are always trying to collaborate and, uh, uh, and communicate with one another and provide extra context. So that's how we do it. Cool. Makes sense. Anyone else want to jump in on that one or? Okay. Next question. Uh, this next question is from Colin Pierre and it reads, I work on the support team and I found it challenging to convince the product team to implement product feedback and add features to the roadmap. Any tips on how to get buy-in from them? Maybe, uh, maybe Jesse would be a good person to answer seeing his, he's the product team. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you got to bug us a couple times, uh, but I, you know, I think it's it's really kind of framing it in like a story, right? Um, I'm always interested to hear not only the customer perspective, like what what is the pain point, um, how many customers are experiencing this, and what's kind of the impact. But I think it's really important to frame it like from a internal perspective as well, right? Where the team spending X additional hours that we don't need to spend um, because then there's a business impact both ways, right? Not only can we improve business efficiency, but we can also make a much better experience for the customer. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense too. So um, yeah, I think like we've seen 
things like where people will have custom properties where it could be like potential time saved. Um, and that could be an impact factor, right? Like um, within Canny, you can develop your own prioritization formula and weight different custom properties differently. So, you know, if you have a very big CS team, support team, and you could save a lot of their time, then, you know, there's definite business value in that as well, right? That's, um, that's a good question. So it's kind of, you know, basically building the case and giving you data that you can work with to, to basically say this is a priority for product, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, Ross or Alice, do you want to jump in on that question at all? Or should we move on? I, I was just going to say, like, it, it, it ultimately goes back to how your company values and prioritizes uh, the roadmap because there's a finite amount of resources there, right? So what, what we try to do is not necessarily give the product team product requests, but uh, help frame it in a way that, uh, like, what is the challenge to our customer? And then obviously, like, how many customers is this impacting? How much revenue is this impacting? And then they are very smart people and, and they come up with solutions that can help with those challenges. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I think from the conversation, basically it's been have that deal value uh, passing through to the feature request and helping quantify what the deal potential is, is probably the, probably the biggest way that product interprets that this is a very high priority feature, right? Or that it's for, mm -hmm. um, you know, some an, a customer or a lead that's in a high priority ICP. So um, I think passing through that data that lets product see how important it is, is probably the best way. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we have another audience question from another anonymous attendee. Um, Okay, this is coming more from the product side. This will be an interesting question. Okay, we get lots of feature requests already. How do I politely explain that we won't build something? I, I could take a first stab at that. <laughs> I, I think from, from a sales perspective, uh, like every deal we work on, kind of like I alluded to before, every deal has something that doesn't line up with the product. There's something that they need that we, that we don't have, right? So I, I think it like it's understandable that to be a good sales professional, you need to be able to sell despite those gaps. Um, but you know, how do you communicate it? I, the bottom line is everyone at the company is one big team, right? Like we all have the same focus, and and that's uh, what well I think is revenue at the end of the day, right? But the the product team is helping the sales team increase their revenue, really. So if there's certain things that you're not building, well, what are the reasons for that? And and you know, what are you building or using those resources for that will help the sales team more? Yeah, and I, and I think just sticking on the sales side of things, you know, how do you communicate that this isn't something that's on our roadmap or that um, you know, it's not something that we can prioritize right now. Um, we actually have a blog post and a video all about how to say no to feature requests from customers, uh, because this does come up a lot, right? Like, um, you know, you want to let, let customers and leads know that, uh, you know, you're hearing them and you're listening to them and you'll, you'll consider it, but sometimes there's just not a business case for it. Right. Unfortunately. And can you help them figure out workarounds or other solutions and, just try and be constructive really right cool uh jesse how do you how do you tackle this one when uh, you have to tell maybe you have to tell the sales team that you know you can't build these features and hopefully yeah. they have uh, promise they're being built <laughs> yeah yeah never happens uh uh you know for us i think it's kind of the one of the really great things that we've done uh and how we leverage canny and future requests is that we log everything right so that's not necessary doesn't mean it's going to get done ever or next week next month but it um one kind of communicates to customers that we're willing to listen and willing to hear folks out and then you know maybe a year down the road there actually is the business case and traction to tackle that uh request but it's you know for us it's kind of being honest uh with folks and just saying you know there's not 
that's not a priority right now, or that's not something we can accomplish. Um, certainly, if there are existing features that can kind of to Ross's point, do maybe 80% of what they're looking to do, then we might lead them in that direction. Because I think there is always going to be those gaps. It's kind of how do you overcome those objections, um, improve our value with the features you do have. Definitely. Uh, that's a great point. Um, cool. Well, I think that is actually the end of our audience questions, unless one comes in as I'm saying these words, but doesn't look like it. So with that, maybe we'll give people four minutes of their day back. Uh, thank you to all, our entire panel. I really enjoyed this discussion. Great points. Um, and yeah, thank you again uh, to all of our attendees. Thank you for joining as well. We'll be sending out the recording shortly. Uh, feel free to share it with anyone you think would enjoy it. And everyone, have a great day.